join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name on this day in which we remember the tragedy in our nation ten years ago. As we come before you, we come before you asking for your fresh revelations and measures of your grace to be known and seen by us and by our nation. Father, we ask that you would bless us with the beauty of your presence as we gather and that we would be filled with the power of your love. For we offer this to you in the wonderful name of your Son, who is Lord and Savior of our life. Amen. Good morning. I want to say welcome to the people who are, are members of our church and a special welcome to those people who are guests. If you are a guest here for the first time, we hope that uh, before you leave that you will stop in the narthex and just give us your name and address. When you do that, we'll be able to have someone stop by your home just to drop off a mug for you, a mug that is filled with information that will tell you about the many ministries and the many programs that are offered here at this church. In the meantime, we hope that you enjoy the fellowship and that you enjoy the worship service with us this morning. A good welcome to the people that are watching on channel 222. We're glad that you have joined us this morning for this special service that we have. And we want to let you know that if you have a prayer need, please call the church at 855-1158. Someone will be here to take your call and we'll help you in any way that we can. We want to give another special welcome to our organist emeritus, Roger Halstead, Haddlestad. Roger, stand. <laughs> Most of you know that Roger was here for a long, long time and moved away, and he's come back this weekend, and we're just delighted to have him, and especially to have him singing in the choir. So uh, shake his hand before, before you leave today. If you will now, uh, oh, I need to remind you to uh, pass the attendance pads if they haven't been passed already. You know that's how we are able to keep track of folks and check in on folks that, that aren't able to be here. Now if you'll open your... Uh, Bro uh, bulletin <laughs> to opportunities and events. Um, I am going to do a, a really quick thing because I looked at this and usually I go through and I try to highlight one or two or maybe three things that, that I need to really highlight, but I ended up with red dots all over my page. So I'm going to go real fast. Pack a sack Sunday is next week. That's nothing to slow down about. Get those things, bring them in. Havenwood is going to be the recipient of what you bring for Pack a sack next week. Do a good job. United Methodist Men's Dinner is this Wednesday. They are honoring firefighters and police officers, so please, if you haven't signed up for that to come to that dinner, you can still do that today. Get in touch with Keith Pruitt, please. The community parking lot rummage sale is this Saturday. Read the specifics in there and participate as you are able. Um, we, LifeWorks is starting this Wednesday night. The great, one of the great things about LifeWorks is that we're going to have a prayer service from 6 until 6.30. We hope that whether you take classes or not, you will come to the prayer service. Our church needs prayer. Our families needs prayer. And uh, there's just so many things that we can dedicate that little half hour a week to. So please, make it a point to come. And then for those of you that want to stay for classes, we've got some great classes that are starting Wednesday night disciple class, there's a prayer study class, and there's also a spiritual gifts class. So one of those I'm sure will appeal to you. We hope to see you there after the six o'clock prayer service. And I'm going to stop while, while I'm ahead, but I do encourage you to read everything in, in the announcements and mark those things that are important to you that you want to make sure you get a chance to, uh, to participate in during the week and the weeks ahead. Thanks. Ten years ago today, I'm sure you remember where you were when at 7.46 Central Time, a tragedy happened in New York. And then it began a series of tragedies that happened in Washington and in Pennsylvania. That morning at 7.46, I was brushing my teeth. And I was getting ready to go to a funeral. I, I, now, I don't always remember the funerals I go to, but I remember this funeral. And I heard Matt Lauer and Katie Kirk on the Today Show say, something has just happened to the World Trade Center. 
And I stepped out of the bathroom with the toothbrush in my hand and I stood there and I watched. And this is what we saw. We just had a, a plane crash into Alpha 4 of the World Trade Center, transmit a second alarm, and start relocating companies into the area. The World Trade Center, tower number one, is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. We have a number of floors on fire. It looked like the plane was aiming towards the building. join us as we pray. Father, as we gather as your people, we remember the tragedy of that day. We remember where we were in our emotions, our thoughts, our fears. The horror we visualized as we continually watched news reports and as we were possibly concerned about people that we knew that were devastatedly touched by this tragedy. Today, Lord, ten years later, we still remember. And we thank you that you're sovereign and that you're holy and that you are at work still healing hearts and putting shattered dreams together. Father, as we remember today, we invite you to take hold of our heart. Inspire us to be your people of faith, to do all that you've asked us and called us to do. In the saving mighty name of your Son, who is Lord and Savior of our life. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray and we say together, Amen.
join me in our call to worship printed in our bulletin. God makes the sun rise and set. He is faithful from generation to generation. God makes summer and winter come and go. He is faithful from generation to generation. God helps plants grow and flowers bloom. He is faithful from generation to generation. God gives us food to eat, places to live, and people to love us. God is always with us. He is faithful from generation to generation. God keeps His promise to us. He is faithful from generation to generation. Let us praise our faithful God. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. He is our good God. And we're grateful today to have opportunity to worship in His name. And we have opportunity to greet those around us. Will you greet those around you and make sure everyone is made to feel welcome in the house of the Lord?
scripture this morning is the 23rd Psalm. It is in the King James Version. Rather than just listening to the word of God, I invite you, if you would like to do so, to recite it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. If our ushers would come forward for our tithes and offerings. Today as we remember a tragedy, let us also remember the blessings of the life we've been given here in the United States of America and here in God's creation. We can remember by giving back a little, just a little of what God has given us. We can also remember that one extra dollar that God has provided that laying lonely in our pocket that can do so much good around the world.
Most gracious, merciful, and giving Father, we give you these gifts back from the bountiful blessings that you've given us. Please accept them in your mercy and grace that we are the children of, your, of you, our God. Please bless us this day and this week. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Now's the time to share our concerns, our joys. If you'll take out the slim insert that's in your bulletin, you can follow along with some of those that I want to highlight and look on the back of this sheet and know that all these people and families need our prayers. Celebrations, we have Ralph and Connie Clark have made a donation to the music department in honor of their 55th wedding anniversary, which will be on September 15th. Sandy Fitch has also made a donation to our children's ministry in remembrance of her stepmother, Beta Keck, who passed away on Sunday, September 4th. I do need to add a couple people that are in Mercy Hospital. Ivan Peschel is there. Please keep him in your prayers. And Max Fishbach is awaiting news to see if he's going to need surgery. So keep them in your prayers. They're both at Mercy Hospital. If you have a prayer concern or joy you'd like to share with us, there are blue cards in the pews that you can... Fill those out and give them to one of the ushers or one of the pastors. There are also some small prayer boxes in the narthex. You can leave those in. They're on the, the, the north side here of the narthex. is a small box. But please fill one of those out if you have a prayer concern or something you'd like to share. We want to, as a church, pray with you and for you. 
Now if you would, let us prepare together for prayer. Let us bow together in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you this morning with many emotions. Emotions of sadness, emotions of fear, and hopefully emotions of joy that you are here with us. Lord's bless, Lord, bless us as we remember. As we remember a tragedy, help us to know that this life is full of choices. And thankfully, here where we live, we have been given the privilege and provided that privilege through the freedom within our country, through the sacrifices of others who have given their lives, their time, and still give their lives and time for the freedom that we enjoy. Lord, help us to make decisions that are to your blessing and your glory, to choose what is right over what is wrong, to choose blessing over curse, to choose life over death. Lord, ten years ago, human beings chose to in their life and the lives of many others. This Sunday we choose to remember, we choose to forgive, but most of all, Lord, we choose you as our blessing. We choose you as our God. We choose to live a life of faith and of salvation given to you, to, through you, to us, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And through your Son, Jesus Christ, and His saving grace, we pray your prayer this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, our special guest speaker is Linda McIntosh. Linda had an opportunity to be an eyewitness of the devastation that took place at the World Trade Center. She was there as part of a medical team. She's a native of Arkansas. She resides in Desark in Prairie County, and she's a nurse practitioner. And I was real excited when in, in, early in the summer when I called Linda to see if she'd be able to come speak. She said yes, and we are honored today to have Linda. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to come and tell you what God did at Ground Zero through me. And if you don't mind, I'd like to pray just a minute. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for your grace and your mercy, your love, Lord, and your forgiveness. And Lord, as I give your testimony today of what you did at Ground Zero, Lord, I ask that you open their eyes that they might not see me but that they see you. Lord, that they see that 
It says in your word that in this life there will be troubles. However, that you've sent Jesus Christ to overcome those troubles. Lord, I hope that they see that what Satan means for harm, you turn around for your good. Lord, we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As Brother Jamie said, I could ask each and every one of you where you were on September 11th, and you could vividly tell me where you were. That morning, I want to read you my devotional that morning before I saw the World Trade Center devastation. Mark 13, 5 through 8, Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. That was my devotional that I wrote in my journal that morning before I got the call from my husband on my way to work when he said, Linda, turn on the radio. I was driving from my house just 10 minutes from the clinic, and I listened to what was going on. And as I got there to the clinic, we turned on the radios, and, and I saw patients in between time. And I was telling my staff, you know, if it had been two years earlier, I'd probably be deployed and on my way to ground zero. But two years before that, I, I was a member of Arkansas One Disaster Medical Assistance Team, and I had become an inactive member. I was an a EMT paramedic in the streets of Little Rock for 12 years. I flew for a helicopter for Baptist Med Flight. I had hazardous materials training. I had FBI clearance. I was one of the paramedics who took care of President Clinton when he came to town. Um, had a lot of training in disasters. I had been incident command at tornadoes, at plane crashes, at different devastating um, disasters throughout the state of Arkansas. And I had signed up for that team, and because I had gone on to be an advanced practice nurse and I was practicing in my hometown in Desark in a small community, I had already given away all my equipment. I'd given away my uniforms, my boots, all that stuff, because I didn't think I'd ever need that again. And so I told my husband that night, I said, you know, boy, I'd hate to be one of those rescuers going. Because one of the things that always bothered me was burn victims. I took care of a lot of burn victims and the smell. You know, I could see a lot of sights in it not bother me, but smells always bothered me. So I told him, I said, I cannot imagine what they're going through. And then, <laughs> on September 20th, I got a phone call at my clinic. And they asked for Linda McIntosh, and it was the State Health Department. And they said, you've been deployed to Ground Zero. And I thought, why me? <laughs> you know, I'm not supposed to go. And so from that moment, I want to read you what I began. I was also a critical incident stress um, debriefer for those different disasters in my past. And one of the things that I've always told my patients and the, my coworkers to do is begin to journal. When you're in a situation, begin to journal about that disaster and write down your thoughts and your feelings and work through them in order to help you get to the other side. So my journal for this event begins September 20th, and I want to read you the first day of my journal. September 20th, 2001, day one, preparation, the call. I received a call at 11 a.m. from the Arkansas State Health Department Disaster Medical Assistant Executive. She told me I was being deployed to Ground Zero, New York, October 12th through 24th, 2001. On September 11th, 2001, the unspeakable happened to our homeland. Terrorists flew civilian hijacked airliners full of innocent Americans into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, causing the highest death toll in the United States since the Civil War. 
At the sound of the woman's voice, a chill went over my spine, and the past disasters I'd participated in played like an old movie through my mind. Fear, adrenaline rush, a strong desire to go surged through me. I immediately said, yes, I'll go, and I don't know where that came from. She gave me the details of our debriefing tomorrow at 6 p.m. at the Arkansas State Health Department. When I hung up, I was visibly shaking, kind of like I am right now. <laughs> uh, Steve and I had just talked of how I would hate to be one of the rescuers now because of the horrible smell of decaying bodies and rotting flesh. Smells have always bothered me more than gory sights. I've been trained to handle any emergency, hazardous materials, search and rescue, forensics, investigation, nursing. I should not be going, though. I have been an inactive member for two years. Lord, why me? Is it because of the FBI clearance already? Or is it God's plan for my life? Tonight was our weekly Bible meeting at Dean's house. After the singing and the worship and praise session with Tim and Dean preaching their hearts out, Dean did a special thing for me. He had everyone lay their hands on my shoulders, and while they prayed for God to use me in a mighty way, it was as if heat from their hands were transferring to my body, and I knew in that moment, God is why I will be traveling to New York. I'd never had anybody lay hands on me and pray for me before. I pray God uses me as a witness of his grace and his mercy. I pray that he gives me the courage to say the right thing and to minister to the co-workers, to the rescuers, to the victims and the officials. And this was my Bible scripture that night before I went to bed. Hebrews 10, 35 through 36. Do not lose the courage you had in the past, which has a great reward. You must hold on so you can do what God wants and receive what he has promised. <clears throat> Psalms 138, 7. Lord, even when I have trouble all around me, you will keep me alive. When my enemies are angry, you will reach down and save me by your power. At first I dreaded going and was afraid, and now I cannot wait until we are there. God will provide whatever I need at the time to bring all honor and glory to him. Only he is worthy. That was day one of a journal that took me through the end of October. And every day, God provided scriptures for me that when I was afraid, he was there. It's amazing. I looked back at that. Excuse me. I looked back at that, and I, t I told Brother Jamie, you know, I gave testimonies in the churches when I came back from Grand Zero. Anywhere they'd asked me to go, I went. At the one-year anniversary, I went. And at the fifth-year anniversary, I went. But I hadn't picked it up in five years till, ja till Brother Jamie called me. And when I picked it up and when I read this journal on Labor Day, I read of what God did there because he met every need for all of us. And it was through his amazing grace that he let us go. It's funny, we went to, um, my husband and I, went that night to that debriefing. And we were there and we got to see slides and pictures of what was going on behind the scenes. We saw the pictures that you saw in that video that Brother Jamie showed. But when we got to the debriefing, they told us things like, the Hudson River is approximately two blocks from ground zero, and that the subway ran underneath the World Trade Center, and it ran up to the Hudson River, and that because of the destruction, there were cracks in the concrete wall at the Hudson River. And on September 20th, they were backfilling it with concrete and sand from the other side because they were afraid that the cracks would rupture and it would kill the 2,000 rescuers that were on scene trying to rescue those people. They told us stories of the tanks that had chemicals inside that were in the restaurants and the jewelry stores and that the fires were still burning and that if the fires got near those tanks that they could rupture and that there would be a phosine gas that would be released that would kill all the rescuers on site. 
And that's how they prepared us to go do this. <laughs> and my husband was sitting there with me, and they said, uh, by the way, if you don't have your federal ID, you're not going. And so he just kind of relaxed because he knew I couldn't find my federal ID. And so he didn't think I was going. And so we were sitting there listening to all this, and um, at the end of it, they told us, they said, and by the way, we need you to fill out your last will and testament before you go, because we don't know you're coming back. And so my husband says, I just want you to know you're not going, okay? <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm not going. I don't have my ID and I'm not going, so we'll be part of the team back here behind and we'll be praying for everybody else. And so what actually happened was at the end of it, the commander said, those of you that don't have your ID, meet me down front now. And there were four of us that went down and said, we can't find it, you know. And so it just so happened that our commander was going to Washington, D.C. to work in Rockville, and he was going to be there a week, and he took down our height and our weight, and he took a picture of us on a digital camera, and he said, I need you to be ready to go in 24 hours. Because although we were deployed on September 20th, we were on 24-hour standby. They could, if anything else happened and they needed us, they'd pull us immediately. Our projected date to go was October 12th, but you can see they moved it up, and we actually went October 9th. We actually went in on the 9th. And we started out, this was a rescue mission in the beginning, and it started out with a team of 45. By the time it got down to October 9th, when we actually flew out, they had dwindled our team down to 22. I did not know I would be one of those rescuers till I got a phone call at 10.30 at night before my plane left at 4.30 the next morning. Um, on the day that he told me, go ahead and get your uniforms, I told the commander, I said, I don't have any of my equipment. He said, go online, print off the equipment list, and have it ready to go in 24 hours. This was a Friday night. So I began to pray, and I thought, okay, God, if this is you and you're sending me to New York, then I need to know it's you. Because if you're not sending me, I don't want to go. <laughs> but if it's you sending me, I'll go. So I prayed, God, here's two and a half pages of equipment that I've got to have in 24 hours and be ready to go. I don't want to drive to Little Rock to get it. I want to go to Searcy, Arkansas, and if this is you, you're going to provide every bit of this. I went to Searcy, Arkansas and went in a supply a surplus store in Kensett, Arkansas and got three pair of Desert Storm tan BDUs, just my size. I went to a police supply store in Searcy, Arkansas and I said I need two pair of leather puncture resistant gloves and I need a size small and the lady looks at me and she said ma'am this is a police supply store and, and you know we don't have a lot of police officers with small hands. We order usually mediums, large, and extra large. And I said, will you please look for me? And she came back and she said, you know, we have two pair, just your size. I went to a country and western uh, boot store, and I said, I need a pair of military, steel-toed, steel-shanked boots. And the man said, I can order you a pair and have you here, a pair here in three weeks. And I said, i got to have them in 24 hours. And he said, well, if you can't find any anywhere else, he said, I have roper boots that are steel-toed and, and steel-shanked. And he said, you can come back and you can put them inside your BDU. I said, okay. So I went to every other store in town, couldn't find the boots. So I went back to Hayes Western Wear and I said, I need to look at your roper boots. We went to my size. And on the top shelf was a pair of military, steel-toed, steel-shanked boots in my size. And I said, what are those? And he said, oh, I forgot. Someone ordered those and never came and picked them up. They were just my size. Four hours later, my mother and I were walking out of Walmart with $800 worth of equipment. And I said, okay, Mom, this is the test because I have to have a set of dog tags, one for my big toe and one for me. <laughs> and I said, I got to have them. And I said, uh, I guess I'm going to have to drive to Little Rock, to North Little Rock, to McCain Mall, to the engraving thing. And as we walked out of Walmart, there was a machine there that said, put $5 in and get your dog tags here. <laughs> and I said, okay, this is God, and I'm going to New York. 
From that moment on, I had no doubt that God was sending me to New York. If you'll show the slides, please. This is the view that we had as we flew over in the airplane. Go ahead. This was the view of the World Trade Center before. Next slide. This is what amazed me. You know, I saw what y'all saw, the, two, the planes hitting the two buildings. What I didn't see was 17 acres of devastation. The World Trade Center and the Marriott Hotel are the tan buildings in the middle. The red buildings around it, when the buildings collapsed, the jet fuel ballooned out around it. And the jet fuel went through those three buildings and totally burned them out and destroyed them. The blue buildings around had so much debris and devastation that people inside of those buildings were killed when the, when the buildings came down. All the buildings in the yellow either had windows blown out or just minor damages. You could still use portions of it. But there is 17 acres of destruction there. See how close the Hudson River is? It was one block away. That blue, light blue was the Hudson River. That's where they were on the back side filling it with concrete. Next slide, please. That's my commander. That's Tim Tackett. And by the way, I called him as I came through. He lives in Dardanelle. And I called him as I came through Dardanelle on my way here. And I said, Tim, if you don't have anything to do, I'm giving my testimony of Ground Zero at Bella Vista. Come, come with me. And he called me yesterday. And we were in Walmart. And one of the things that happened to Tim there is he had been, he's the one that went to Washington and got my ID. And he was having a really bad time. He'd been there for four weeks, and he was having a really bad time, and he came to the tent one day. And I could just tell by looking at him that he was struggling. And one of the books that I carried with me was this small book that says Bible Promises. And it had the things in there where you could look up courage, where you could look up wisdom, where you could look up whatever you needed. And the only thing there was God's word. And I asked him, I said, Tim, are you okay? And it was funny because he had come to that tent to check on us. And when I saw him, I called him behind this partition we had up there, and I said, are you okay? And he said, well, no, no, Linda, I'm really struggling. <laughs> And I said, let me give you something. And he said, he said, do you have any words of wisdom for me? And I said, let me give you something. And I said, I don't have, but God does. And I gave him this little book. And he sat behind on a cot, and he sat and he began to read that thing. And he told me yesterday that he was giving his testimony in his church today, and he has a photo exhibit on at the Arts Center in Little Rock that he's got to be in Little Rock at 1 o'clock today. And he said, Linda, when I give my testimony, he said, I give the testimony of how that little book saved my life. And he was saved because of the scriptures in that book. Next slide. The little blonde there is Leslie. She was my roommate. And we made a pact when we went there. Um, by the way, when we got to Ground Zero, um, we were deployed as part of the United States Public Health Service's federal government. We were put on the federal payroll for two weeks. And we were told we had a Colonel Storch assigned to us from the Pentagon who was a psychiatrist, and he was there to make sure that we mentally stayed fine. But he told us that we were there to take care of the medical needs of the people on the scene, but that we weren't there to put off our religious biases on them. So we couldn't pray for them unless they asked us to or wanted us to pray for them. And so Colonel Storch gave us this speech, and Leslie and I, the first day that we were in the tents, we found these lime green stickers, and you'll see them on our helmets down there, that has a purple monster on it that said, I give hugs. So Leslie and I decided that if we couldn't pray with these people on our own, that we could at least show them the love of Christ. And the way that we were going to do that was we were going to go up, and my line was, Hi, I'm Linda, and I'm from Arkansas and I give hugs and drugs, and I'm down in that medical tent right there, and if you need me, you come see me. And so everywhere we went, that was my line. Leslie's line, hi, I'm Leslie, I give hugs and drugs. Next slide, please. This is the cross that you see that is still at ground zero today in the memorial, and that's one of the first visions of it. Next slide. Next slide. This is the amazing thing for me. Every day they took us, we were stationed in a 50-story um, New York Sheridan, and the whole 50th floor was commandeered by the Pentagon and FEMA and Federal Emergency Services. 
And they mapped out these elaborate plans. It took us an hour and a hour and a half to get to the scene every day on this bus because we had to go a different route every day because of the security issues and all those things. And every way in, you had National Guardsmen with M16s, and you didn't get in unless you had all your IDs and all that. Every day that I went to the site, the first vision I saw was a cross. That's the cross with the piece of metal that they moved it out of the rubble and they put it up on a concrete block right there. Next slide. That's the cross after they got it over to the side and they were having a prayer service that morning. Next slide. Look between the walkway above. That was my first day at Ground Zero. That was my first sight. And I knew God was watching over me because of the cross that I could see in the middle of it before I ever got there. Next slide. There were shows of patriotism from all over. That's one of the flags. You'll see this netting across every building because one of the things that was happening is the wind from the Hudson River was blasting us. And it was in October. And the broken glass in those buildings was coming down. One of the days a piece of broken glass came through the top of the Liberty tent, the medical tent at Liberty Station. And as it came through, it landed just a shoulder's width away from a patient that we were taking care of. That tent had to be taken down and moved for its safety's sake that day. Next slide. There were banners from all over. Next slide. These were some of the fire trucks. When we saw the devastation of those buildings, you have to know that the, one of the fire stations was facing the World Trade Center South. And the fire trucks had all been positioned, the fire trucks and ambulances had all been positioned around the location at the bottom of the World Trade Center. So when the World Trade Center collapsed, it destroyed all of their equipment. Next slide. That's the pile of the rubble. The fires burned till December. Next. They had two of the largest cranes in the world there, and they had 36 other cranes. These cranes hoisted people up inside of there with cutting torches, and they cut down the steel beams. Next slide. That's, look at the people. That's one of the largest cranes in the world. Next slide. They would hoist these people up over that burning pile, and one of the rescuers inside one of these dislocated his shoulder. The wind blew the thing into the metal beam and dislocated his shoulder, and that was one of the injuries that I took care of while I was there. But they would take a settling torch and they would cut those steel beams and then they'd lift them out and put them on trucks. Next slide. See how they're hoisted in there? They're cutting those beams away and attaching them to cranes and those other devices and putting them on trucks. Next slide. See how they're hoisted up, working over the top of that pile? The next slide. That's just more of the rubble. The buckets. There were firefighters and police officers who had been there since the day it happened that had not gone home. They were actually sleeping in the burned out windowed hotels where the windows were all broken out of the hotels. And those hotels were our restroom area. We would leave our medical tent and go in there. We had EPA and all the officials from the government that were coming around telling us that those buildings were condemned due to the asbestos levels and that we could not go in there to use the restroom without our respirators. Police officers and firefighters were sleeping in there and going back to the pile. Next slide. This is Leslie and I with all of our gear on one day. They would come around and they would warn us. Every time the wind shifted, we had to have a new evacuation route out, and we had to have it mapped out because of the danger of the gaseous chemicals that were still in there under the fires. Next slide. It's just more of the fire. Next slide. They sprayed $105,000 worth of foam in 24 hours one day while we were there. I was amazed. Leslie and I worked 12 hours at the site at Ground Zero, and then we went back to the 50-story hotel and worked another four hours in the sick bay at the hotel. At the 50-story hotel, it housed DMORT, which is your disaster morticians, the anthropologist and the FEMA, the government officials. And so we had a sick bay back there that we'd go work four hours afterwards. The pictures that you see that say 19, that was September 19th. They're chronologically dated and timed. 
because before we left there, we became friends with those people. And they had a documented time thing that from September 11th on, they had pictures of the scene every day. And Leslie and I were fortunate enough that they brought us a disc of those pictures and they presented those to us. Keep going. This is more of the rescue. That's the burned out buildings. I need to tell you one thing about the church. And that is that, keep going through the slides. Our mission there, this is more of the devastation. Keep going. Those, those things right there, keep going. Those things shifted 10 degrees over there. More of the devastation. Keep going. That's winter gardens. Keep going. They have one way in and one way out for, that, uh, for the debris. Go ahead. Keep going. There's your aircraft parts and your FBI. Keep going. Rescue. Just keep going through those slides. And I want to tell you one little story about the church before I have to finish. That is that my station was the Church Street Station. And at the Church Street Station, that's the fire department, at the Church Street Station, they fed us off that Church Street. And there, while we were there, one of the things that happened to us is we had a church service. And at that church service, we were actually able to sing Amazing Grace that morning. And that's the reason I love to hear Amazing Grace while I was here this morning. Colonel Storch, the one who told us that we could not pray with these people, he was our psychiatrist. He'd heard about us singing Amazing Grace in a ballroom that morning before we went to the site. And he came to the station. There was one day that we had met some firefighters. Those, those police officers there were on the street corner with us. And we had laughed and talked, and, and they were inside the station when Colonel Storch came to the station. And he said he was leaving to go to the Pentagon. That's in front of the little church. And he was leaving to go to the Pentagon that morning. And he said, Linda, he said, I need to hear you sing Amazing Grace. And I said, you know, we have people in this tent. And he said, well, he said, I just need to hear you do this before I go. And we had a firefighter there and um, police officers there. And one of those police officers had a seven-month-old baby at home that he hadn't seen uh, in four weeks. And he had come into that medical tent because he had an ear infection. And I had treated him, and he was there, and this Lieutenant Callis, they were all out front, and I had asked him that morning, I said, will you tell me something about yourselves? And he said, they, they were laughing and teasing, and he told me about his little baby. And I told him that I would keep that with me in my heart from then on. And as Colonel Storch and I went behind the, the trape, we had draped a thing in the middle of this tent. And as we went behind that, that piece of plastic, and we began to sing Amazing Grace, those people formed a circle around us, the doctors and the fire department and the medics. And we sang Amazing Grace. And when it was over with, at the end of the day, when we opened our eyes and saw those people, they had tears just running down their face. And when we went to, the, to leave the site that day, it was our last day on the site, one of those police officers came and hollered at me and he said, Linda, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you and Arkansas DMAT 1 and Amazing Grace will be in our hearts forever. There were things that happened on that site. There were, there were different people that were there that um, needed prayers that you could pray with when they asked you to. There were members that didn't know Jesus in our own team that came to know the Lord. God used that trip to begin the spiritual healing of those firefighters. These cartoons were actually made by a firefighter in Little Rock whose hands were burned in the fire and he sent them to the fire department in New York. Keep going. That's a picture that you saw. That's the picture that I saw. The little church became a haven for us. That's the site it is today. You know, everything that happened there, I believe, was for God's glory. 
And I believe that he took different people in there at different times to minister to those individuals. And it wasn't any of the life-shattering things. You know, we didn't do CPR and save lives and all these things. We took a little bit of foreign bodies out of eyes and sewed up lacerations and took care of the respiratory problems that there. are But I believe that through God's amazing grace, he was able to see Jesus in a lot of the rescuers that were there. And if you don't mind, Brother Jamie's going to come to the front. And um, if you don't mind, I'm going to sing your hymn of invitation as Brother Jamie comes. And um, if you don't know my Jesus, the one that's there for you, no matter what your situation is, the one that has a purpose for your life, that he knows your next step, and that he's in total control of, that he's a sovereign God, that he has a plan for you no matter what it is. If you don't know him, Brother Jamie's going to be up here. If you have a need, um, if you're struggling, if you don't know where you're going to go next, and you have a mission need that you want to know where God wants you, then come talk to Brother Jamie. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers tolls and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and his grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the God's praise than when we first begun. To God be the glory. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. On display before you are some of the artifacts that Linda has. She invites you to come by and look at them and look at her, her book. As we prepare now to go out into a wait, waiting world, a world that is watching, we go forth as 
conduits of God's grace to reveal to a waiting and watching world that in the midst of tragedy and tribulation that God is sufficient and that His grace is, is able. As we close this morning, we're going to sing together the first verse of our invitation hymn, Because He Lives. I invite you to stand and join with me as we sing. Please take time to, to greet Linda, and she has a great friend here, Carol, who is with her, and we're ex we appreciate you, Linda, so much for coming and being with us today. Well, we don't care. It was good. <laughs> but go now into, in the knowledge that our God is faithful. He's faithful in our past. He's faithful in this present moment. And our God is a God who's faithful for our future. God bless you. Have a most wonderful week. And join in all the things that will be happening here for us as a church family this week.